Hello, everybody. Welcome. Uh, we can see that uh, everybody's been uh, coming in from the lobby. Thanks for hanging out there for a few minutes uh, before we got started here. We're delighted to uh, have you with us today, and we look forward to an engaging session. Be sure to find the chat uh, box and be ready to put your, your questions, comments, thoughts in the chat. Uh, the panel here will love to, to take your questions and uh, react to them, and obviously we'll just manage our time as best we can uh, to get to as many of them as we possibly can. Uh, I'm Mike Richardson. I'm with Ref Global, and I head up uh, strategic relationships globally. And one of the most uh, strategic relationships we have that we are most proud of is that relationship with ERA, Expense Reduction Analysts. And we are blessed to have uh, four panelists with us today who each have their area of uh, specialty and experience with ERA. Uh, and we'll tell you more about the fact that they're also forming REF uh, financial executive forums in their backyard as we speak. Uh, so we'll mention that as we go along. And we're even more blessed to have uh, Mark Nielsen with us here, who is a longtime uh, career uh, CFO. He calls himself a recovering CFO uh, <laughs> and now prolific uh, board member uh, on for-profit boards uh, and uh, not-for-profit boards, and also a partner with REF in San Diego, where he is uh, building out a fantastic community of REF forums and REF members, uh, and not least of all, inclusive of a financial executive uh, forum, and actually a forum for controllers as well. So Mark is very steeped in our purpose and our passion uh, with REF across all of our kinds of forums, but in particular, with regard to our financial executive forums for senior financial executives and CFOs, uh, which actually is pretty unique to REF. Nobody else is scaling that out uh, with the magnitude with which we are across the country and, and soon to be across the world. And we'll talk about uh, the four or five places that uh, our, our good friends, our ERA consultants that are with us here today, are also putting financial executive forms into place uh, uh, next month, actually, in September. So uh, uh, we look forward to mentioning that. And uh, we're here to talk about cost reduction and value insights today. It's all about uh, being recession ready at all times uh, and uh, future ready uh, by uh, unlocking uh, uh, invisible opportunities to liberate costs and value and I know Mark uh, Nielsen, let's start with you. You've often used the phrase found money. So why don't you tell us a little bit about uh, that, Mark, and a little bit about what you've learned over the over your journey and all these different modes that you've been in about cost reduction and value insights. Mark? Yeah, uh, thank you, Mike. Um, so I, uh, when I was CFOing, I, I, again, I'm, I'm now sitting on boards uh, and stuff like that, but when I was in the CFO role, I was, I had an ERA representative from back in the Midwest call on me. I didn't know anything about uh, this whole idea of shared savings and the term cost and the term reduction are both negative words, right? <laughs> and and um, I much prefer the term found money um, because uh I, th I think that's a good thing all the time. And too often people switch into cost reduction mode when there's trouble at the door. And when it's something that they, uh, the, if they establish the right mindset, which I'll comment on in a minute, of best practices and optimization, those are game any day, any time, uh, because most of the, the, the increase in cost or the runaway costs are actually incurred during good times Right. You know, we've just come out of a crazy cycle and things are normalizing. It kind of had to recede in a recession to normalize. But um, mine's, there's really two elements that I think the guys will talk about is, and I didn't, I didn't start off with this. I was a fairly traditional CFO that thought, well, I could do all this stuff myself. Everything else, I do it myself. Um, but after I learned what ERA did years ago, um, I thought, well, wow. Uh, I went to my boss. I said, you know, here's what they're proposing. They want 50% of the savings. And he looked at me and says, well, uh, what are you, you're focused on the wrong thing. Don't focus on what they're going to get. Focus on what we're going to end up with, which, because if you go do it, we're going to end up with nothing. So mindset is the most important element 
to this whole discussion mindset, yeah. which is about yeah. best practices, optimization, and letting putting someone putting your ego on the side. The economics, of course, are important, but I would say mindset is by far, and I, I know the ERA guys are all nodding, that if you don't have the right mindset in the CFO, the CEO, and the staff, then okay. you're going to leave a lot of money on the table and make your whole team work harder to compensate for your lack of curiosity. Yeah. Oh, a great start, Mark. And, and indeed, see lots of nodding heads there. And everybody, please do find the chat box and please don't hesitate to put any questions or comments in the chat as we go along here. We'll try to get to them. And Mark, if I may, uh, let me just ask you a little bit more, because you pretty much have led the charge as, as long as a decade ago in many ways, and, and now with REF, of uh, forums specifically for financial executives. Everybody, REF has forums for CEOs. It has forums for a diverse range of, of executives across the whole org chart. But Mark, you led the charge in saying, let's also specifically have forums for financial executives and CFOs. Tell us more about why, Mark. Where did that inspiration come from? And why uh, do you uh, think that's so crucial? And why is it so valuable to the CFO and senior financial executive members that we've had for a long time now? Tell us more. It came from my own experience, Mike. You were a uh a peer group facilitator for a well-known organization, and I was one of your members, and I was in there as the managing partner for a business unit that I was working for, and I'd never dealt with CEO kind of thoughts. Well, so I'm in that group, and over time, I'm going, you know, I was a CFO for 25 years. CFOs should be having these same conversations. They're the co-pilots, right? And, and oftentimes, perhaps most of the time, the CEO looks to that person, the head of the defense, if you will, as their co-pilot. And I thought, my goodness, these conversations, these uh, changing one's thinking and mindset, uh, CFOs need more of this. And so it turned out to be true that like the other day in, in our uh, CFO meeting here in San Diego, if you came in, you would not know from the dialogue that this was a CFO meeting because of the topics were the same thing you'd be talking about CEOs right. or even board members. So, right. so I realized that I didn't have that as a CFO, and, and that was a need. There's a, a loneliness because CFOs manage their departments, but they also have to manage the CEO oftentimes because yeah. the CEO rarely knows a lot about finance, accounting, you know, and all that yeah. stuff. So you end up, you know, managing both directions. So it's a very unique job subject to burnout if you don't get your mind right. Yeah, and, and everybody, we've written a few bits and pieces, and we'll we'll put we'll put some links in the follow up that we send out to you about the fact that CFOs and financial executives need to be co pilot number one uh, to the to the CEO. And Mark, just a little bit more because you make sure that you do some deep dives with your CFO uh, peer forums into ROI generating insights right to help make sure that the members the cfo and financial executive members are experiencing a strong payback on their investment of of money and time of of being in the forum itself just tell us a little bit more about how you do that well every every month uh this week being no different there's some uh, oftentimes it's our local era representative who couldn't make the call today but um who is that person? And uh, speaking about different topics, uh, a, a lot of what they talk about is mindset, but we get into specifics. We actually keep a scorecard in our CFO group of how, how much money the members have saved. So it's become a little bit competitive, which is fun. Mm -hmm. And uh, we're in the millions of dollars of savings right. of things <laughs> that were awesome. overlooked. <laughs> which is a large number compared to the very small number of the membership <laughs> subscription cost, everybody. I and, think uh, most of them have already covered the, their membership for the rest of their lives. <laughs> yeah. And the and the half a day a month uh, that these meetings typically are. Well, thank you, Mark. That's a great start. Everybody, Mark Nielsen uh, and Mark will be weighing in more here as we go. If we may, Rob, let's uh, let's turn to you first. Uh, Rob is in, in Pittsburgh. And Rob, you've had a background and a specialty and experience specifically uh, amongst amongst a broader uh, base, specifically, though, uh, with supply chain, finance and operations. And tell us uh, about some of the work that you've done there, Rob, and what kinds of cost reduction and value insights do you find 
uh, customers arrive at. Yeah, yeah. Thanks, Mike. I think that uh, you know I'll give you a, a nice case study. Um, I, I spent a lot of my career with Del Monte Foods in the supply chain area, as you mentioned, um, sort of both in the finance realm and eventually in the operations realm. And so throughout that whole time period, you know, sort of cost reduction projects were, were obviously a big part of what we were doing all the time. Um, but one, one, you know, one area that we found really, and it, you know, it really moves a needle in terms of a cost structure is, uh, is optimization of your distribution network. You know, how, where you produce your products, um, where you're flowing them to your own dis distribution centers and eventually to the customer. How you do that is it's very important. There's so much money that's spent there that you can really uh, move the needle in, on for your, for your cost structure. So uh, back in you know, the late 2000s, around 2008, 2009, utilizing uh, some assets that we had obtained on a recent acquisition, new warehouse space, uh, new manufacturing facilities, we sort of redesigned the flow of, um, of a lot of our pet food and canned uh, fruit and vegetable items um, through, through the network. And so, you know, that, that took obviously a team effort. You know, you, you, you need to, to have everybody on board. Um, everybody sort of, you know, the, the, the production planning it starts there, make sure the, the products are, are available so that you can take advantage of um, cost-effective transportation modes, right? It's not effective to truck uh, products from the East Coast to the Midwest or even the West Coast, right? You want to take advantage of things like rail, intermodal, things that are slower, uh, but much more cost, much more cost effective. And so, that, you know, that, that's, that's where you start. But then you also sort of, you know, understand, okay, where's the best place to produce this mix of items? Where's the best place to forward deploy this mix of items for the customers in, you know, in the Southeast per se? Um, what makes the most sense and sort of you know, the full optimization really uh, changed, changed the game for us. And uh, that, that initial project, uh, Mike saved about, uh, it saved eight figures. It saved about $10 million annually. And uh, even, you know, for a company, even the size of Del Monte Foods, that's meaningful. I mean, that, that's meaningful yeah. to your, your supply chain cost structure. So, you know, what were some of the, some of the value insights that were there um, that, that, that enabled us to do that? Uh, a good understanding of our network, first of all, a good understanding of our product mix, who's buying what and where. Um, right. You know, some of our largest customers, of course, were the big box stores, right? And, and, and so they were who were buying a significant part of, of those pet food items and those cans, vegetable and, and, and fruit items, et cetera. And so understanding exactly what they were buying, how often and, and where design network around that. And so that, that, was, that was one value insight. But then there are macro things that you need to take into account, right? Things like the, the current level of diesel fuel, um, the current level of the truckload, the intermodal uh, rate markets, what does that look like right now? Um, that those things are changing all the time. And so, you know, like I mentioned, that, that initial project saved eight figures. It was, it was a big deal. We kept an eye on it though. And then a couple of years later, two and a half years later, we said, you know what? Let's take another look at this. Not that we have new assets, not that our, our network's really changed, but, but things have changed. Diesel fuel has changed. Our product mix right. has changed. Who's buying right. what and where? Um, so we took another look at it, did another optimization. And, and that, you know, it wasn't the same eight figures, but it was seven figures this time, right? And so wow. it's still meaningful. Yeah. Um, and so, you know, kept the eye on that. Um, over the course of a couple of years, and we even yeah. did it a third time a couple of years later. So, sounds. I mean, obviously, it it sounds complex. It it doesn't sound easy and obvious, which is why why the 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 cost and value uh, possibilities were locked up until you invested the effort in unlocking them. Right, which is often not easy and obvious. Which is uh, obviously. Uh, tell us more, Rob, now that you do this sort of, uh, you know, in your ERA role, um, uh, tell us a little bit more about that. I mean, you know, you, we might think that, well, surely if, if, if you can see it, then the senior financial executive or CFO can already see this. Uh, how, can, how can we be helpful in unlocking a next level of cost and value? Yeah, I, I think it's really digging deep into all of the details and sort of finding that money, as, as Mark's saying, right? Get, right? get to that found money because 
within a you know supply chain cost structure is again there, there are a lot of dollars and 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 sure you're doing fairly well negotiating your truckload rates and you're doing pretty well negotiating your LTL rates etc. But um, it's until you really dig in and get in and look at all of the details and understand the nuances yeah. of your network, you might not be finding all the money that you can. Right. right. Mm -hmm. So um, you're you're about to launch a financial executive forum in your backyard in Pittsburgh, uh, Rob. Just tell us a little bit about that. Yeah, thanks, Mike. Very very excited about it. Um, yeah, we're going to launch an REF financial forum here in in Pittsburgh. Um, as you mentioned previously, we're planning to get going in September. So um, really excited to be bringing the power of uh, of collective intelligence to, to the financial executives yeah. here in Pittsburgh. So you know, in the process now of of gathering the initial. Uh, the yep. initial group, and so excited about how it's gone so far, and um, you know, really want to 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 keep it going to build a, a good, strong forum here in Pittsburgh. Yeah, beautiful, and everybody, you know, being in a in a ref financial executive forum will be first and foremost about the sort of uh, horizontal breadth of uh, leadership development as as co pilot number one, as we heard from Mark, and as we're now talking about, also have the sort of vertical depth of drilling into helping you find and uncover and liberate uh, cost and value opportunities, not least of all, to help you make sure that you get a really strong uh, payback in, in hard cash terms on, on your investment in, in your membership of REF. So if you're interested, everybody, if you're in the backyard of uh, Pittsburgh, uh, if you're interested, then uh, drop uh, Rob a, a direct message in LinkedIn or, or uh, find out how to connect with him and he'll be delighted to explore that with you. Well, that's great. Mark Nielsen, uh, uh, please, yes, uh, weigh on in here. What else would you add to what we've been talking about so far? Well, I'm sure uh, that some of the other ERA uh, guys will, will talk about it. But, you know, um, one of the big things I learned from my engagement with ERA, because I was a customer many times over, a big fan, uh, was that too often the internal folks, whether they're procurement or CFO, whoever, are too focused on the unit price which is a tug of war over the margin between you and your vendor, whoever they are, whether it's a product or a service. Whereas ERA does a great job of creating win-win conversations with those product and service suppliers, because oftentimes uh, there are different things. In fact, there's a bunch of other places to save money, even bigger money than just talking about unit price. So yeah. big fan of awesome. changing the conversation from price to everything else. So, yeah, well done. Excellent. Well, great, great. Well said, Mark. So, Larry, if we may, let's come to you. Um, you've had 30 or 30 or more years of experience, Larry, deeply engaged in managing and owning restaurants. I'm, I'm getting hungry just thinking about it. And um, uh, tell well, us a little. <laughs> while you're getting hungry, I'm getting nightmares. But go ahead. <laughs> I can well imagine. Tell us a little bit more, Larry, about how those experiences helped you have insights into cost reduction and value liberation and, and how that now plays into the work that you do with ERA. Well, it, it, uh, in the restaurant business, you know, we've, you know, Rob's talked about millions and thousands, so on and so forth. In restaurants, uh, it's pennies. And uh, <laughs> it, is, it is all about the pennies. Um, so uh, I, I learned, you know, for 36 years, you know, the value uh, of a dollar. When I first started e my ERA practice, it was like, you know, I'm talking to owners, every dollar makes a difference. I don't care how much it is. Um, you know, one of my first projects, I, I saved a, saved in $364 in office supplies. It was a small, small uh, <laughs> surgery uh, group of surgery guys, um, doctors, um, but it was 180 bucks they didn't have before. And, uh, and, and they got, they got it. And when you're talking to an owner of really any size company and, and, and good CEOs and CFO, they get it, they get that dollar, um, and, and what a difference it can make. So that background certainly laid the foundation when I'm talking to folks, uh, that every dollar I know makes a difference. Yeah. Yeah. My, what's coming up in my mind is kind of penny wise and pound stupid if we're not careful or, or the US dollar equivalent of that. Excuse yeah. me, everybody. I'm English originally. Um, uh, and so tell us a bit more, Larry. Now, as you work with uh, members and or clients, uh, how, what, what, are the, what are the struggles that you help them get through when they go, they go looking to find 
found money and liberate it and unlock it so it can flow to their bottom line? How do you how do you help them through those struggles? Well, first of all, it's fun. Uh, you know, who doesn't, who doesn't, who doesn't love saving money? I mean, come on. Um, so, so that part is fun, but you know, Mark mentioned a couple of, a couple of things, uh, earlier. Number one is ego. You got to put the ego aside. And, uh, if there is ego at work, it is just not going to happen. Um, so, so having that, that availability and that openness to like, Hey, not only do I not have all the answers, but guess what? I don't have the, all the expertise. I, I've been, a, you know, let's say Mark's been a CFO for 25 years. Show him a telecom bill. Really? You're going to be able to take me through the telecom bill? Come in, come on. Um, so, so it, you know, so it's that that's the that's the the beauty of what we come. It's not about what you what you what you know. It's about what you what you don't know and, don't and know. You, know what yeah. you shouldn't know. Right. You shouldn't know. Um, right. So that's the beauty of when you get into that. Then it now is it more fun but more open that uh you know uh, of the crazy stuff that you can find and, and when you take a deep dive into some of these categories yeah. um that that are you know fees and so on and so forth that nobody even heard of or knows knows what they do uh yeah. we're we're able to uncover that and with experts like well rob is a, is one of our uh really really talented uh uh category specialists they they really know how to dig into yeah. those fees and and uh, and get the answers and then and many times reduce them or get rid of them yeah, and, and that it, that's actually a great sort of expression, everybody, of the value of a peer group. Um, when you're in a peer group, it's all about, you know, making sure there are no blind spots. And um, obviously, peer groups are most powerful when uh, the members of the group are coachable, hungry, open, transparent, want to learn from each other. And, and there are no real egos in the room getting in the way of, of that process. And and there's just a, a sort of turbocharged curiosity to, to well, how did how did you do that? How did you unlock that? Where, where did you go looking for that? How did you sort of triangulate that and, and, and begin to see that? And so that, I think, Mark, perhaps comment a little bit more here. That was where your instincts sensed such a great kind of win-win alignment between what we do in ref forums and what ERA does and therefore, the marriage, everybody, of ref forums facilitated by ERA consultants as the forum leaders. Uh, Mark, just tell us a bit more about that sort of uh, symbiotic realization that you came to. Well, you know, some of that comes back to part of our, our I always tell at the beginning of every CFO meeting, uh, even though it's the same members most every month, um, is, hey, guys, I'm, I'm here to help you feel more valuable to your CEO be more valuable, earn more money, be a contributor. Even the sales guys will be high-fiving you in the hallway because you're putting points on the bottom line. And uh, again, it goes back to your co-pilot uh, uh, yeah. you know, example, Mike, is that if you really want to earn your place in the cockpit as a co-pilot or in the boardroom or wherever, then you know, contributing to the bottom line by putting your ego aside, like Larry said, and uh, you know, turning on your curiosity Boy, yeah. when, when the ERA team, when those, when those guys come in and your curiosity is right where it should be, they're going to make you a hero. Yeah. And uh, yeah. So I don't know if that answered your question. Yeah, no, exactly. And and as you just sort of said, you know, a contribution to the bottom line so readily becomes a contribution to the top line because we're now more readily able and confidently to reinvest and reinvest and reinvest, not least not just in revenue generating you know initiatives but technology and productivity and platform and infrastructural things that can multiply that that sort of top line effort and, and go ahead mark yeah and i put a, some of this in the chat room but you talked about the revenue equivalent of cost savings i'm sure that right. my era friends talk about yes. that but, you know yeah. if you if you multiply that by your bottom line margin the savings oh my gosh you I mean you just made a yes. big sale with do it in the conference room with no additional effort yes. Uh, yes and also the valuation multiple comes into play because if you got a six seven eight multiple then exactly. fifty thousand in savings is worth a lot more yeah, become and i don't think those, those conversations often get emphasized enough and i think if cfos yeah. would oh by the way almost every meeting someone on our scoreboard of savings they come in, they write down what they did in the last month that put points on the board. And boy, boy, we celebrate it. So, yeah, yeah. yeah. So, Larry, you, you are going to be diving headfirst into that uh, natural marriage between 
the ROI insights and the and the ref uh, value and blind spots because you're forming a financial executive forum in your backyard as well uh, in Louisville. Uh, tell us a little bit more about that. Uh, I am, and and that's a part you know that in doing this as I, as I mentioned, it, it's fun. Um, there's a real emotional. I think Mark touched on. There's an emotional factor here about uh, the lone wolf CFO existence. Um, I mean, even though they're a peer and a co-pilot, you know, with the the CEO, many CEOs, you know, they don't don't talk to me about a spreadsheet. Right. And I'm, I really do not want to. Don't talk to me about that because they're their visionary, et cetera, et cetera. So the CFO can be a very lone existence. So the idea of putting the, a group together like this, it 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 not only answers a call, but it answers a, an emotional need that there is no other place for for that and i see that all the time in my in the last 15 years of my era practice these guys are and and ladies are stressed out they're you know they're, there's no one to really share yeah. with they can't share inside their company uh their frustrations or challenges um so so this is an emotional need as much as you know a financial benefit and and cost exactly. analysis kind of thing this yeah. is an emotional uh benefit and that is what i'm looking forward to most in this group is being part of 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 addressing, leaving that, giving that 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 space and that that place, that forum, to be able to really emotionally uh, connect yeah. with some of these challenges and uh, and share in and get and get real feedback and guidance from peers with no fear of judgment. Yeah, exactly. Well said. And uh, everybody, it's. You know, it, it's not just the quantitative stuff. It's also the qualitative stuff. It's not just the management stuff. It's the leadership stuff. And, um, you know, I've been joining uh, pretty much everybody, Larry, Rob, uh, Dan, Mike. I've been joining them in conversations with prospective financial executive members for their respective forums in their in their respective places. And and just in a very natural, relaxed, conversational way for an hour, getting to know each other and the prospect, it's amazing how many times the prospect, uh, prospective member will say in their own words something pretty close to, it's lonely at the top. I don't have anyone I can turn to, to, to really be able to talk about these challenges as transparently as I can talk about it, you know, with with us on the call. So this is very real, everybody. I, I've been in I've been in the space of peer forums for twenty years now, and it's been that it's been that way for twenty years, and uh, it's only getting worse because the world is only moving faster, with more disruptive change. Um, so this is only getting harder. So well well said, Larry, and uh, we're excited to see uh, your forum taking shape in the Louisville area, everybody. So if you're interested to connect with Larry, please direct message him. He'll be more than happy to explore that with you. And Larry, Mike, if we maybe can... Larry, you could work with Mike uh, on his pronunciation of an Englishman <laughs> trying to pronounce Louisville. So. I, I, Sorry, I, I, yes. I was just going to say, do us all a favor, okay, and just stop just stop trying to say it. Him. Okay, yeah. Okay. Wherever Larry that's, is, that's... Just <laughs> Northern <laughs> Kentucky. He's in <laughs> Northern Kentucky. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, Mike Pleasure, if we can if we can turn to you now, um, you've had a, a career and, and, and a track record and experience in uh, third party logistics and in value chain development. And, and you were telling me the other day that you were doing a complex uh, manufacturing and distribution program for a large broadband service provider. So, uh, Mike, just tell us a little bit more about some of the value and cost reduction insights that you've picked up along the way. Thanks, Mike. I appreciate it. Um, yeah, prior to my my ERA career, um, I was heavily involved in uh, contract manufacturing, third party logistics work, and I was uh, probably my most complex program uh, I was ever involved with. Involved um, working with not only uh, a multitude of of end customers, if you will. But you have the technology developer, you have the network operator, and you have an incredibly complex supply chain, um, both servicing, um, you know, the technology servicing the, uh, the network provider. And it was really our job to integrate all of that activity. 
um, we got hired to to manufacture, uh, you know, a, a very at that time it was lead, bleeding edge technology, um, but it had to move very rapidly because the the technology shelf life was evolving. So we were heavily involved in developing from a standing start from a prototype, um, you know, a printed circuit board assembly that had over 2,200 parts on it, um, all the way to like, how do you put that board into a chassis? How do you build the ancillary uh, um, components into the chassis, put a, put a box on it, um, put that unit into you know, some sort of uh, industrial or end user packaging. And then how do you deploy it to, you know, 8 million households? Um, <laughs> Sounds easy. <laughs> yeah. Um, water off a duck's back. But now this was one of those highly uh, complex uh, models where from the day you started, every day, the componentry, the technology, uh, got a day older and a day less expensive or from the view of the marketplace, what they would bear. So we had to move really at breakneck speed. Um, the, the, the vendor list that we managed was literally in the hundreds of suppliers kind of all over the world. Um, but, but what was really the, the insight from all of that, because we moved from prototype to pre-production to production to then scale it and that involved three different factories over a, a you know like a 14 month period so what was crucial all about uh, throughout that entire ecosystem was communication and integration of the parties it was yep. executive alignment yeah and that's so true in what we find at era um yep. our our uh, engagements are highly um, uh, susceptible to a, a misalignment. If, if you have a group of executives that are gung-ho, can't wait to go, it can be completely derailed by, you know, that other executive who wasn't in right. the loop. Right. Um, and that was, that was always uh, a challenge is to keep everybody on the same page. Yeah. Um, you know, organizational uh, alignment, cross-discipline. Um, one of the things I learned uh, that is so true today is the whole notion of, you know, having that finance team <laughs> sit with sales, sit with supply chain, right. and really understand, be deeply involved, deeply committed to what's right. going on because, you know, the clock is ticking. Yeah. Um, you want to get to the market at a certain price point and it's like day old fish and vegetables and never get fresher. <laughs> so well, back to the restaurant is, business. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Everybody's focused on that. And so it's it's really coordination on a yeah. on an hourly basis in some cases. I love so, what you just said there. I love that. And the, and the, and the idea that um, as Mark was kind of saying, that um, more and more everybody, um, CFOs and financial executives, have got to work harder to walk in everybody else's shoes and understand their challenges and, and get up and down the hallway more and spend more time and, and, and immerse more deeply in really understanding their challenges so that you can see the big picture and the big equation. And isn't it, isn't it funny, everybody uh, that's listening here, if you, if you just take from what Mike has said, you might imagine that cost reduction and value insights is is going to be all about technical stuff. It's all going to be it's all going to be about the math, right? And it's it's going to be about you know more complex ways to unlock math, um, you know, and and business processes and 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 all of that kind of stuff. And and of course, it is partly that. Of course, it is. But what we've just heard Mike say is that well, yeah, but the pivotal stuff is the human stuff. It's the teamwork stuff. It's the communication stuff. And, and that, everybody, again, Mike, is, is why we arrived at this natural alignment of ERA and REF coming together around financial executive forums. And you're, you're launching one in your backyard, uh, Mike, the sort of greater San Francisco Bay Area. Um, tell us a little bit more about that. 
Yeah, it's an interesting, um, you know, I'm, I'm fascinated by, you know, what I see as a very positive outcome over time um, because there's such diverse geographies. And so we want to really bring a lot of diverse, there's a tremendous amount of diversity in San Francisco in terms of yeah. uh, industries and sectors served, uh, whether it's manufacturing, healthcare, life sciences, you know, higher education, what have you. So the the real critical success factor is really bringing those diverse set of financial executives together in that kind of a sharing environment and really to and, and be supported by, you know, the the ambassador network to every forum is crucial yeah. Yeah. to that ongoing success because <clears throat> yeah. there are great opportunities for, you know, this integration, close integration CFO to CFO yeah. in a in, in that kind of a you know a shared you know confidential environment. Yeah. And and like everybody else has said before, you know, it, it's lonely at the top. And and given the dramatic evolution of the CFO's role in the last five or 10 years, you know, they're sitting in on every major decision in a company. Yeah. Exactly. So, yeah, and and everything you've said about diversity diversity of industry diversity of kind of business everybody and and a bell curve of diversity of size of company and high tech and low tech and local and global and all that kind of stuff and mark um that's really the secret sauce isn't it, it it's to have cfos and financial executives yes but across a diversity of of kinds of businesses and industries and and, and situations and challenges and phases of the journey and that's really where the power of peer forums come from, Mark. Uh, tell us more, Mark. Yeah, just uh, jumping in in between here is that we've been uh, in our CFO uh, forum uh, recently, we've been embracing a, a new uh, title, if you will, a moniker for CFOs, the facilitator of excellence. Mm. And uh, too often, CFOs are busy playing the instruments in the band as opposed to being the conductor. And so we're trying to get more of them to recognize that their highest and best value is uh, whether it's helping, you know, uh, working with ERA or other, you know, to unlock those found money to fund other initiatives, right, and improve the bottom line and free up funds that you didn't think were there. But facilitator of excellence, I love that because that's what we're trying to create and uh, that seems to be catching fire is that, that they embrace that idea of, yeah, my job here is really wherever those best practices are, whether it's in, you know, cost management or whether it's in artificial intelligence or systems, people process, whatever it may be, their job is to go find that and, you know, not be the person that's playing all the nine positions on the baseball field, but yeah. be the facilitator of excellence. Yeah, yeah, very well said. And 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 to be in a forum, everybody, where the other members are on that same pathway as well and sharing experiences and stories and inspirations and, and accountability with each other to to play a bigger game uh, and, a, uh, and a better game progressively as, as we go forward. So again, if uh, if you're in the San Francisco Bay Area, everybody, and you would like to connect with Mike, uh, just direct message him and LinkedIn, and uh, he'll be more than happy to explore uh, the financial executive forum that he's he's putting together next month as well in his in his uh, backyard. Um, and last but very much not least, uh, and we can guess we can guess where Dan is located in Austin, Texas. Uh, Dan uh, is the more recent um, uh, uh, ERA consultant that uh, came on board more recently after a thirty year career as a CFO uh, across multiple industries, everything from large public companies to smaller private companies uh, internationally, including living in mainland China twice, <laughs> not just once, but twice, uh, working in the field of, of you know, industries with complex supply chains and optimizing uh, sort of make by decisions and, and big decisions on whether to invest or to partner and all of that. So, so Dan, as you, as you shift gears into your ERA work now and and forming a financial executive forum in your backyard in Austin, what uh, value and cost reduction insights do you bring forward with you from all of those experiences? 
Yeah, well, thanks, Mike. It's, it's great to be here, and I appreciate everybody for joining us. You know, as similar to Mark, I'm a recovering CFO. I've, at this point in my life and career, have said, hey, the W-2 world served its purpose, but there's more, uh, there's more to life, and I think I have more to uh, value to add by sharing those experiences. I love the analogy of the conductor of the orchestra. I've used that for 30 years, right? Yeah, that, you know, one of my insights as a sitting CFO, you're always involved in investment trade-off, make-buy type discussions. And I think that this particular area of cost reduction is, is often one that's overlooked. And so I've sat in situations where, you know, I've been approached by ERA-like firms, uh, although I think ERA is unique in terms of its breadth, right? There are firms out there that do specific cost category things, and, and they're a dime a dozen, right? But ERA has a breadth here that I don't think exists in the market. And so for me, this investment thesis of, hey, okay, I've got an indirect procurement team, let's say, because I'm a certain size. Well, the real question then is, do you have the, do the deep domain knowledge to understand what's optimal? Right. And I think where ERA comes in is to try to be, you know, uh, augment the team. Right. We're not there to audit. Right. We're there to help and ultimately understand where the profit and value insights are. Right. And, and as a strategic resource to augment the team. So the first one, I think, is is really in summary is is that return on investment question that CFOs face all the time. Right. Should I throw labor at it? Right. And if so, what's my return on investment? And I think there's, you know, hundreds of case studies where the return on investment and the time that it doesn't take from the organization when they engage with ERA is, is I think, one of the fundamental things that, that, that uh, CFOs need to think about and address. Yeah, yeah, very well said. And again, you know, I think all of these case studies that we've been touching upon everybody, it, it isn't, as, and as Rob said in particular, there isn't a one-size-fits-all answer, is there? Yep. And there isn't a one-time answer fits all times. As Rob said, you've got to revisit and revisit because, because the landscape has changed, the commodity prices have changed, the supply chain has changed. And to some degree, uh, Dan, you're always kind of having to hedge your bets anyway, aren't you? Because you're not quite sure how the future is going to shape up. And so you can't bet the farm on one view of the future. You've got to sort of stay hedged for multiple views of the future in terms of what might shape up. Can you just talk about that challenge yeah. a little bit more? Yeah, I think, you know, again, CFOs or, or executives, right? They're always focused on strategy, right? And typically, you know, companies are either, you know, trying to grow or if they're in trouble, they're trying to turn things around. And naturally in that, right, there are certain initiatives that come up, you know, that require attention from the, the, the complete executive team, right? But what often gets missed, right, is that indirect cost. Somebody made a comment earlier, maybe it was in the chat about that, you know, the, the first thing that happens is, you know, labor gets taken out, right? And so, you know, I, I also agree. I think that's somewhat of a mistake, right? If you haven't really taken a strategic step back to evaluate the entire enterprise, this, I think, is an area that often gets missed. And then when people say, hey, wait, let's let's set a cost target, right? Let's go save 7, 7 or 10% in G&A. Then it gets to the next question, which is, well, do you really have the competencies to go do that? And then the obvious next question is, and then do you have the resources to go do that? Yeah. And I think yeah. in my experience, having been a part of large multinational corporations where I was involved in building a global supply chain team and putting process around that and driving and making sure that, that in the case where we spent, in this case, $5 billion a year was the spend under management, well, in that case, we needed to have a deep expert that understood the software space because we bought a lot of software. But as it related to office supplies or uniforms or whatever, you know, any of those other categories are, it did not make sense, right, to go do that. And therefore, then there was something left on the table that barring an engagement with an ERA-like organization, you wouldn't know what you didn't know unless you went and took a look under the hood. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, and I, and I see a question mark in the chat about RIFs, I, I, I guess that means reduction in force, correct? Did you have a comment on that, Mark? Uh, no, uh, just, well, uh, yeah, sure. Um, again, uh, to Dan's point, people go after that first because it's big chunks of money easy by cutting heads, right? Yeah. But it actually creates a, a morale spiral, as everybody knows. Yeah. Um, yeah. But it's also, you know, people that you may never get back. And um, <laughs> so it's kind of short-term thinking, whereas all these other things have... You know, when when you find cost savings, typically they're long, they're going to go on for a long time as long as you keep an eye on it, don't let it drift yeah. back. 
yeah yeah and and obviously obviously the time you get to times occasionally where you have no choice except to have a layoff or a riff and and that's what it is but everybody on this call knows everybody that one of my favorite sayings is the task of imagination is to do the work of crisis without the crisis and of course where we often end up is doing the work of crisis in a crisis, which often involves a riff, a layoff, a reduction in force. Oftentimes, if we're honest with ourselves, because we didn't sufficient, we haven't sufficiently looked in the mirror and come to terms with the fact that we didn't do enough work of crisis without the crisis to avert the crisis, to prevent the crisis in the first place. And that is the power of a peer forum, everybody. You've got 15 members in a room in a totally transparent, confidential place holding up a mirror to each other and and really asking each other are you really leaving no stone unturned are you really leveraging your scenario thinking back to what dan was saying and 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 the the the, the analytical side of it the human side of it like like larry was saying not just once but a second time and a third time like rob was saying with the incredible complexity and the clock is ticking, uh, you know, shelf life kind of way that uh, Mike was saying, that's incredibly hard, everybody, incredibly complex. And unless you have a room full of trusted advisors who can relate and are going through the same stuff themselves and having to learn it the hard way, it can feel very lonely. Dan, um, my, my so, thing, if I can offer just a yeah. second insight is just the other thing I've learned in my career is, you know, to your point about trust, right, is I think there's a lot of people and companies, right, that just inherently trust their vendors. And in some cases, that's warranted. And in other cases, it's actually not. Right. And the reality is, right, that there are certain vendors, certain, you know, industry segments where if you don't pay attention, right, they're going to nickel and dime you, right? Freight is a great example, tariffs, you know, fuel surcharges, and then suddenly, when does the fuel surcharge go away? And I think Larry or one of my other colleagues <laughs> touched about this, right? The devil is in the details. So back to that orchestra analogy, right? As a conductor of the orchestra, as a CFO, dealing with a pandemic right? Dealing with where the heck am I going to go with this newest issue, being the good second chair to the CEO and all those things we talked about. The pressure is, is not going to go away. And the other things like AI that are coming are only going to continue to exacerbate that. So the real question then is, how do you manage those other key relationships where inherently, if you're not engaged or having someone engaged, you're trusting and whatever the result is, is whatever the result is, but you may not be getting the best deal holistically. And it's again, it's not just about price. Yeah. Yeah. Mark, I see your hand up. And then Mike, uh, what, how would you weigh in here? Well, I want to pick up on what Dan just said. Um, you know, one of the realizations that uh, I came to as a CFO, and I'm sure uh, Dan relates, is that when I realized that as much as my insurance broker loves me and takes me to ball games and stuff, that... <laughs> The reality is their job is to keep me happy enough not to leave. Yes. <laughs> Think about that for a second. And you know, the other thing that I, I realized was that the best people to help get a procurement or financial person's mind right on the conversations they should be having with their vendors is your own salespeople. Because right. we hate it uh, on the revenue side, when the customer only wants to talk about price, 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 that's a tug of war, a win-lose margin tug of war. And so every salesperson would say, I hate it when that's all they want to talk about. That's not a good customer. And, and so moving to a different conversation about win-win. So they are, when you got to remember that a vendor's job, most of the time is to keep you happy enough not to leave. And back to the whole economic roller coaster, you know, I know that COVID was a unique period because everybody was distracted by survival and, you know, maybe they were so busy, they couldn't even keep up all that. Yeah. But the enemy of great or excellence is good enough. Mm -hmm. And we're coming out of a good enough era. Watch all the ERA guys nod their heads. Okay. So <laughs> it's because they hear that, you know, or they felt that all the time that people didn't care about cost savings, even though they were busy creating the sins that they'll later find. 
during an up cycle. So it's just human nature that we're fighting against. But I believe that excellence and optimization shouldn't care whether it's an up cycle or down cycle. Right, exactly, exactly. Let's be let's be ready, future ready at all times, recession ready at all times, not just on day one of a recession in a crisis mode. Let's yeah. be doing the work of crisis without the crisis to prevent the crisis in the first place. Mike, uh, pleasure. Did you want to weigh in a little bit? Just yeah, well, yeah. It's 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 kind of like closing the barn door after the cow leaves. <laughs> um, but I will say, you know, not to be uh, this isn't meant as a pejorative to the suppliers in the world, but they they enjoy an advantage over every one of their clients in terms of what they know. Right. And and so, you know, largely what we are able to do at ERA, you know, is leveling the player field, the playing field. Yeah. yeah. You know, it's it's you know, whoever has the most knowledge, right? Who wins the negotiation if if it yeah. comes to that. Yeah. Mike, I always say what you're really doing here is you're not putting a consultant in between you and your supplier. You're bringing sell side knowledge to the buy side of the discussion to exactly. level the playing field. And it's that awesome. simple. Awesome. <laughs> so, Dan, you're you're also forming a, a financial executive forum in your backyard uh, in Austin, Texas uh, next month. Tell us a bit more. Yeah, I am. And it's part of my journey as well, right? As I, you know, I, I head into this, what I call next season of, of life and career. Um, and I won't get into that. But, you know, as I went through my journey, and I think Mark touched on this, right, it is absolutely lonely at the top. And this was true for me personally, even before the pandemic. And then it was magnified, because in my last role, I was not only the CFO, I was essentially the COO. And so it came from a million different fronts, right? And I absolutely experienced, and, and, and I've lived in Austin, you know, as Mark uh, or as Mike mentioned, I've lived overseas, I've lived in Canada, I've seen the world. Um, but what I've come to conclude and I've checked, you know, and, and observed is there was no place to turn. So, you know, the CFOs on the call, right? You've heard of, you know, Finance Executives International, and you've heard of maybe uh, Finance Executives Networking Group or FANG or CFO Leadership Council or any of any number of organizations, right? That in my opinion, are really focused on networking, right? Where's my next job going to come from and or CPE. They are not that safe place, right? Of what happens in Vegas stays in Vegas where you can come in without any judgment and bury your soul, whatever that is, personally, professionally, career, some difficult thing at work and get feedback almost immediately from people that have either seen the movie, acted in the movie or directed the movie. Right. <laughs> That's a great so note. had I had that, right. Uh, you know, I, I, I don't have any regrets about my journey, but as a part of my life purpose, right. I want to try to help other CFOs, right. Particularly those that are up and coming to avoid some of those potholes and, you know, and, and, and river dike breaks that I experienced personally and professionally, right. Because you don't have to be lonely at the top. Right. It is OK to to be vulnerable. Right. And often, you know, finance CFO people, if they come up through the accounting path, they've got a certain mindset. Right. And I think that earlier in this conversation, we talked about a curiosity. Right. And so if you're an individual that's curious or maybe you need to be more curious, well, be curious about where you're at and how are you supported. And I would argue, right, that strategically, if you're the number two in your organization as the CFO, I'm guessing that your responsibilities are beyond just accounting. Well, then where is the growth and development and where are you getting support? And I would argue, right, after all of my due diligence and 30 years of doing what I used to do, that the forums, the peer group forums is an easy answer to solve a whole yeah. bunch of that. Beautiful. So Beautiful I'm excited said. to bring that to Austin. It does not exist in Austin. You know, there are other ref competitors out there that do these peer group forums. You know, Mike, you did it for 15 years with Vistage. And they just don't do it. Now, maybe they'll change someday, but I hope to bring the first true CFO-focused peer group form to Austin, Texas. And those of you that have been to Austin know there's a lot going on in Austin. So awesome. there is definitely well said. Yeah, well said, everybody. So, you know, along the way there, we we, we touched upon the win-win concept. And and I think, Mark, that's that's really how we arrived at our relationship with, with ERA and, and REF, which we're very proud of. Uh, and, and we're very proud of uh, everyone on this call and, and launching their forums uh, next month. And, and Mark's been doing it for years. 
And you know, everybody, we, we've been in the peer forum business for 30 years. Ref, Ref will celebrate its 30th year anniversary next year in uh, 2024, having been founded in 1994. We've got uh, thousands of members around the world in more than, I think, uh, the last count, 20 countries and CEO groups and, and executive groups that stay for a long time. I mean, I had members that were in my forums for 15 years. I think Mark was in one of my forums for 10 or 12 years. Uh, and, and um, you know, on average, I think it's, our number is about eight years, something like that. So, so these groups anyway are very sticky because those members that are like people like us, they mm -hmm. vote with their wallets and their feet. If they're not getting a payback on their investment of time and money, they're gone. And yet, empirically, the evidence is they stay for a considerable amount of time because they clearly are getting that payback, even more so in a financial executive forum because of the reasons we've talked about, where there is this win-win between REF and ERA, where you're getting all the generic value benefits of REF that any category of member gets. And in addition, you're getting the value benefits of ERA and the deep insights and expertise and experience and track record that uh, ERA consultants like those on the call today have in finding, helping you find found money and found value. Um, uh, and so everybody, if you'd like to be uh, involved in a, peer, in a financial executive forum uh, in in Louisville, in the San Francisco Bay Area, uh, in, Pitts, in Pittsburgh, stop. in Austin. <laughs> and there is one more as well. Chris Angel couldn't be with us today. Another ERA uh, colleague, Chris Angel, is also forming uh, a financial executive forum in Raleigh, Durham uh, next month. Oh, and by the way, if none of those geographic locations work for you, we also have the option of a virtual uh, uh, financial executive forum as well, in which case just direct message me or Mark Nielsen and we'll tell you more about that. Mark Nielsen, do you want to start uh, helping me land the plane here? What, uh, what else would you throw on the fire here, Mark? Well, some of the things I put in the chat along the way was, uh, and I'll just kind of finish where I started at the beginning, uh, which is, for me, this discussion on, uh, well, collective intelligence, because don't forget ERA is a collective intelligence organization too, because yeah. that's what they're bringing to your side of the table to help you save money and, and invest it somewhere else. Um, it is mostly mindset. I, I really think that their job is so easy uh, once they get over the, the, co the collaboration and cooperation hurdle, that once that's there and that people are there to, to for the right reason, the cost savings really is easy and it isn't just math I, you know it's changing the conversation from win lose price 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 to everything else and then we'll get to price at the end um so that's what i would say is just uh and then, and then the whole i just enjoy uh I, i'm so energized each month at, at the end of our cfo peer group meeting which is a half day thing had it the other day because all these guys are walking out. They all showed up dragging themselves in there. We're going to, I can't, you know, I don't have time for it. And then they leave the meeting. I am so glad I came, <laughs> you know. <laughs> You've been there. Yes, you that did is, that for, for 15 yeah, that years. Is, that is par for the course, everybody. Uh, a, a monthly peer forum is an opportunity to regain perspective, level set, um, re-energize, refocus, uh, re-engage re uh, in, in the fight, you know, the battle uh, uh, from, you know, day to day, week to week, month to month. Um, uh, Larry, uh, Mike, Rob, uh, Dan, anything else you want to throw on the fire as we uh, begin to land the plane here? No, I'm great, Mike. Thank you. Awesome. Thank great. Well, thanks well, for being here, you, everybody. Mike. Uh, come you. and uh, come and check out uh, the possibility of a financial executive forum in your backyard. Uh, uh, direct message Larry, Mike, Rob, uh, or Dan, or myself and Mark if you're interested in the virtual uh, variant of that. And uh, thanks for being here, everybody. And uh, onwards and upwards in finding found money. We'll see you next time. Thank you.